I'm going to talk about、um, compassion and the Golden Rule from a、uh, secular perspective,、um, and even from a Um, a kind of scientific perspective. I'm going to try to give you a, a little bit of a natural history of、uh, compassion and the Golden Rule. So I'm going to be、uh, sometimes using kind of clinical language,、um, and so it's not going to sound as warm and fuzzy maybe as your average compassion talk. I want to warn you about that.、Um, so I do want to say at the outset that I think you know compassion's great, the Golden Rule is great. I'm a big supporter of both. And I think it's great that the the religions of the world, the leaders of the religions、um, of the world, are affirming compassion and the golden rule as fundamental principles that are、uh, integral to their faiths. At the same time, I think、uh, religions don't deserve all the credit. I think nature、uh, kind of gave them a helping hand here. I'm gonna I'm gonna gonna argue tonight that、uh, compassion and the golden rule are, in a certain sense, built into human nature. Okay, but I'm also going to argue that once you understand the sense in which they are built into human nature, then you realize that、um, just affirming compassion and affirming the golden rule is is really not enough. There's a lo- there's a lot of work to be done after that. Okay, okay. So quick quick natural history of first compassion. In the beginning, there was compassion,、uh, and I and I mean、uh, not just when hum- human beings first showed up, but actually even before that. I think. It's probably the case that in the human evolutionary lineage, even before there were Homo sapiens, feelings like compassion and love and sympathy had 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 earned their way kind of into the gene pool. And biologists have a pretty clear idea of how this first happened.、Um, it happened through a principle known as kin selection.、Um, and the basic idea of of kin selection is that、uh, if an animal feels compassion for a close relative. And this compassion leads the animal to help the relative. Then, in the end, the compassion actually winds up helping the genes underlying the compassion itself. So, from a biologist's point of view, compassion is actually a gene's way of helping itself. Okay? So, I warned you this was not going to be very warm and fuzzy. Okay? <laughs> this, I, I, I'll, I'll get there. I hope to, to get a little fuzzier. To me, this isn't. This doesn't bother me so much the, that the underlying Darwinian rationale of compassion、uh, is kind of self-serving at the genetic level. Actually, I, I think what the bad news is about kin selection is just that it means that this kind of compassion is naturally deployed only within the family. That's the bad news. The good news is compassion is natural. The, the bad news is that this kin-selected compassion is naturally confined to the family. Now, there's more good news that came along later. In, in evolution, a second kind of evolutionary logic. Biologists call that reciprocal altruism. Okay, and there the basic idea is that、uh, compassion leads you to do good things for people who then will return the favor.、Uh, again, you know, I know this is this is not not as inspiring a, a notion of compassion as you you you, you may have、uh, heard in the past. But from a biologist's point of view, this reciprocal altruism kind of compassion. It is ultimately self-serving、uh, too. It's not that people think that when they feel the compassion. It's not consciously self-serving, but to a biologist, that's the logic. It's it's and so you wind up most easily extending compassion to friends and allies. I'm sure a lot of you,、uh, you know, if a close friend has something really terrible happen to them, you feel really bad. And but if you read in the newspaper that something really horrible happened to somebody you've never heard of, you know you can probably live with that. Okay, that's just that's that's human nature. So it's another another good news bad news story. It's good that compassion was extended beyond the family by this kind of evolutionary logic. The bad news is is this doesn't bring us universal compassion by itself. Okay, so there's still work to be done. Now, there's one other result of this dynamic called reciprocal altruism. Uh, which I think is kind of good news, which is that the way this has played out in the human species, okay, it has given people a kind of intuitive appreciation of the golden rule. Okay, I don't quite mean that the golden rule itself is written in our genes, but you can go 
to a, to a hunter-gatherer society that has had no exposure to any of the great religious traditions, no exposure to ethical philosophy, and you'll find, if you spend time with these people, that basically they believe that one good turn deserves another and that bad deeds should be punished. And evolutionary psychologists think that these intu intuitions have a basis um, in the genes. So they do, they do understand that, that you know, if you, want, if you want to be treated well, you treat other people well, and it's good to treat other people well. That, 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 that's close to being a, a, a kind of built-in intuition. So that's good news. Now, if you've been paying attention, you probably are anticipating that there's bad news here, okay? That we, are, we still aren't to universal love. And it's true, because um, although an appreciation of the golden rule is natural, it's also natural to kind of carve out exceptions to the golden rule, okay? I mean, for example, none of us probably want to go to prison but we all think that there are some people who should go to prison, right? So, so we think we should treat them differently than we would want to be treated. Now, we have a rationale for that. We say they did these bad things that, 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 that make it just that they should go to prison. None of us really extends the golden rule in, in truly diffuse and universal fashion. We have the capacity to carve out exceptions, put people in a special category. And the problem is that although in the case of sending people to prison, you have this impartial judiciary uh, de determining, you know, who, who gets excluded from the golden rule, that, you know, in everyday life, the way we all make these decisions about who we're not going to extend the golden rule to, um, we use a much kind of rougher and readier formula. And basically, it's just like, if you're my enemy, if you're my rival, okay, if you're not my friend, if you're not in my family, I'm much less inclined to apply the golden rule to you, okay? We all kind of, kind of do that. Um, and you see it all over the world, um, you know, I'm the, 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 you see it in the Middle East, people who from Gaza are firing missiles at Israel, they wouldn't want to have missiles fired at them, but they say, well, but the Israelis, or some of them have done things that put them in this special category. The Israelis would not want to have an economic blockade imposed on them, but they imposed one on Gaza, and they would say, well, the Palestinians or some of them have, have brought this on themselves. So it, it's these exclusions to the golden rule that, that amount to a lot of the world's trouble. Um, and so, the, 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 and it's natural to do that. So the fact that the golden rule is in some sense built into us is not um, by itself going to bring us uh, universal uh, uh, love. It's not going to save the world. Okay. Now, there's one, one piece of good news I have that may save the world, okay? Are you, are you on the edges of your seats here? Yes. Good, because before I tell you about that good news, I'm going to have to take a little excursion uh, in, through some academic terrain. So I hope I've got your attention with this promise of, of good news that, that, <laughs> that may save the world. It's this non-zero-sumness stuff you just heard a little bit about. It's just a quick introduction to game theory. This won't hurt, okay? It's about zero-sum and non-zero-sum games. If you ask what kind of uh, situation is conducive to people becoming friends and allies, the technical answer is a non-zero-sum situation. And if you ask what kind of situation is conducive to people defining people as enemies, it's kind of a zero-sum situation. Okay, so what do those terms mean? Basically, a zero-sum game is the kind you're used to in sports, where there's a winner and a loser, so their, their fortunes add up to zero, okay? So in tennis, you're, you, every point is, is either good for you and bad for the other person, or good for them, bad for you. Either way, your fortunes add up to zero. That's a zero-sum game. Now, if you're playing doubles, then the person on your side of the net is in a non-zero-sum relationship with you because every point is either good for both of you, positive, win-win, or bad for both of you, it's lose-lose. Okay, that's a non-zero-sum game. And in real life, there are lots of non-zero-sum games in the realm of economics, say. If you buy something, that means you'd rather have the merchandise than the money. Uh, and the, but the merchant would rather have the money than the merchandise. You both feel you won, okay? In a war, two allies are playing a non-zero-sum game. It's going to either be win-win or lose-lose for them. So there are, uh, there are lots of, uh, of non-zero-sum games in, in real life. And you could basically just reformulate what I said earlier about how compassion is deployed and, and the golden rule is deployed by just saying, well, compassion most naturally flows along non-zero-sum channels where people perceive themselves as being in potentially a win-win situation with someone, their, their friends, their allies. The deployment of the golden rule most, most naturally happens along these non-zero-sum channels. So kind of webs of non-zero-sumness are where you would expect, you know, compassion and the golden rule to kind of work their magic. With zero-sum channels, you would expect something else. Okay.
So now you're ready for the good news that I, I said might save the world. And uh, now I can admit that it might not, too, now that, now that, now that I've <laughs> held your attention for three minutes of, uh, of technical stuff. But it may. And the good news is that history has naturally expanded these webs of non-zero sumness, okay? These webs that can be these channels for compassion. Um, you, you can go back all the way to the Stone Age, and I think from, you know, technological evolution, roads, the wheel, writing, a lot of transportation and communication technologies have just inexorably made it so that more people can be in more non-zero-sum relationships with more and more people at greater and greater distances. Okay, that's kind of the story of civilization. It's why social organization has grown from the hunter-gatherer village to the ancient state, the empire. Now here we are in a globalized world. And the story of, of globalization is largely a story of non-zero-sumness. Okay, you've probably heard the term interdependence applied to the modern world. Well, that's just another, another term for non-zero-sum. If, if your fortunes are interdependent with somebody, then you live in a, in a, in a non-zero-sum relationship with them. And you, you see this all the time in the modern world. You saw it with the recent economic crash where you know, bad things happen in the economy, bad for everybody, good thing, or, you know, for much of the world, good things happen, it's good for, uh, for much of the world. And, you know, I'm happy to say I think there's really evidence that this non-zero-sum kind of connection can bring a kind of, can expand the moral compass. I mean, if you look at the American attitudes toward Japanese in world, during World War II, Look at the depictions of Japanese in the American media as just about subhuman, and look at the fact that we dropped atomic bombs really without giving it much of a thought. And you compare that to the attitude now, I think part of that is due to a kind of economic interdependence. Any form of interdependence, non-zero-sum relationship, forces you to acknowledge the humanity uh, of people. So I think that's good. And the world is full of non-zero-sum uh, dynamics. Environmental problems, in many ways, put us all in the same boat. And there are non-zero-sum uh, relationships that, that maybe people aren't aware of, okay? So, for example, probably a lot of American Christians don't think of themselves as being in a non-zero-sum relationship with, with Muslims halfway around the world. But they really are. Because if, if these Muslims become happier and happier with their, with their place in the world and feel that they have a place in it, that's good for Americans because there will be fewer terrorists to threaten American security. If they get less and less happy, that will be, uh, that will be bad for Americans, okay? So there's plenty of non-zero-sumness. And, and so the, 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 the question is, if there's so much non-zero-sumness, why has, has the world not yet been suffused in love, peace, and understanding? The answer is complicated. It's the occasion for a whole other talk, maybe. But certainly, um, a couple of things are that, first of all, there are a lot of zero-sum situations in the world. And also, you know, sometimes, again, people don't recognize uh, the non-zero-sum, uh, the non-zero-sum dynamics in the world. And I think in both of these areas, you know, I think politicians can play a role. This isn't only about religion. I think politicians can help foster non-zero-sum relationships. You know, economic engagement is generally better than blockades and so on, I think, in this regard. And, and politicians can be aware and should be aware that when people around the world are looking at them, are looking at their nation, okay, and picking up their cues for whether they are in a zero-sum or a non-zero-sum relationship with a nation like, say, America or any other nation, human psychology is such that they use cues like, you know, do we feel we're being respected? Because, you know, historically, if you're not being respected, it's probably not, you're probably not going to wind up in a non-zero-sum, mutually profitable uh, relationship with people. So we need to be aware of what kind of signals we're sending out, um, and, 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 some of this, uh, and some of this, again, is in the, in the realm of kind of political work. If there's one thing I could encourage everyone to do, politicians, religious leaders, and us, it would be what, what I call expanding the moral imagination, okay? That is to say, your ability to put yourself in the shoes of people in very different circumstances. This is, this is not the same as compassion, but it's, it's conducive to compassion. It opens the channels uh, for compassion. And I'm afraid here we have another good news, bad news story, which is that the moral imagination is part of human nature. That's good. But again, we tend to deploy it selectively. Okay? Once we define somebody as an enemy, we have trouble putting ourselves in their shoes, just naturally. So if you want to take a particularly hard case, 
say, for an American, somebody in Iran who's burning an American flag, say, and you see them on TV. Well, um, the average American is going to kind of resist the, the, the moral exercise of putting themselves in that person's head and is going to resist the idea that they have much in common with that person. And if you tell them, well, they think that America disrespects them and even wants to dominate them and they hate America. Has there ever been somebody who disrespected you so much that you kind of hated them briefly? You know, they'll resist that comparison, and that's natural, that's human. And similarly, the person in Iran, when you try to humanize somebody in America who said Islam is evil, they'll have trouble with that, okay? So it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to get people to expand the moral imagination to a place it doesn't naturally go. I think it's worth the trouble because... Uh, you know, again, it just helps us understand, if you want to reduce the number of people who are burning flags, it helps to understand what makes them do it. Um, and I think it's good, good, uh, good moral exercise. I would say here, again, is where religious leaders come in, because religious leaders are, are good at reframing issues for people, you know, harnessing the emotional centers of the brain to get people to alter their awareness and, and just reframe the way they think, you know. I mean, religious people are, religious leaders are kind of in the inspiration business. It's their great calling right now to, to get people all around the world better at expanding their moral imaginations, appreciating uh, and that in so many ways they're in the same boat. I would just, just sum up uh, the way things look, at least from this secular perspective, uh, in, as far as compassion and the golden rule go, uh, by saying that it's good news uh, that, that compassion and the golden rule are in some sense uh, built in uh, to human nature. Um, it's unfortunate that they tend to be selectively uh, deployed, um, and it's going to take real work to change that, uh, but nobody ever said that uh, doing God's work was going to be easy. Thanks. <laughs>